Hello, I'm Christopher Reinkemeyer. I'm a PhD student in Edward Lemke's lab. And first I wanted to thank the IMP and the Bienstiel Foundation for giving me the great honor of this year's Bienstiel Award and recognizing the work of my PhD. And today I'm going to tell you about the goal of creating synthetic membranous organelles in the cell to equip cells with a second orthogonal genetic code. And our major motivation for this is that when you look at the genetic code, which determines how proteins are synthesized in the cell, it's actually comparatively simple and only contains broadly four different types of chemical functionalities. So you have the 20 canonical amino acids and all of them can be classified into polar, non-polar, basic and acidic amino acids. And it can only be envisioned what might be possible if more chemical functionalities could be introduced into proteins and if a protein could basically cover the entire chemical spectrum. One technology which is ideally suited for this is genetic code expansion, which allows to site-specifically incorporate a non-canonical amino acid into a protein of interest into a cell. And key to this technology, orthogonal tRNA-tRNA synthetase pairs, like this pyrolysin tRNA-tRNA synthetase pair from methanogenic archaea bacteria. And this typically works by recognizing its cognate tRNA and aminoacylating it with a non-canonical amino acid. And then the anticodon of the tRNA is usually chosen to decode a rare stop codon, like for example the ember codon, and this can then be site-specifically incorporated into the mRNA of interest, and when this is then translated at the ribosome, the non-canonical amino acid will be site-specifically inserted into the protein of interest. However, this is already one major limitation of this technology, because you choose one of the native stop codons, this will also terminate many other proteins in the cell, and Nothing tells the ribosome to only translate your protein of interest with the expanded genetic code. And for example, in humans, the rarest stop codon, the ember codon, still terminates 20% of the entire proteome. And so you could get a lot of C-terminally modified proteins, which also carry the non-canonical amino acid. When you, for example, do fluorescent labeling studies, they will also show up with this label. And they are also C-terminally extended, which can be toxic. So, at the onset of my PhD, we were wondering whether we could make translation orthogonal so that only the mRNA of our protein of interest is translated with an expanded genetic code. And to do this in eukaryotes, we hypothesized that it might be possible to create a synthetic organelle that exclusively translates chosen mRNAs. So the first thing for this to work is that the mRNA of our protein of interest needs to be distinguishable from endogenous mRNAs. And in order to do this, we tagged our mRNA with MS2 loops in the untranslated region, and these can be specifically bound by the MCP protein. And as the system is derived from a bacteriophage, this doesn't occur in any eukaryotic protein. We then envisioned that we could co-express our paralyzing TNA synthetase and the MCP protein fused to something which we call an assembler moiety, which would then form an organelle in the cell and enrich the tagged mRNA with MS2 loops. And subsequently, these should also recruit the paralyzing tRNA and also some ribosomes, and then only the protein that is translated within the organelle should get modified with the non-canonical amino acids, while proteins translated in the cytoplasm should get terminated when they encounter the stop codon. So how can you create such an organelle? First thing which would come to mind in eukaryotic cell might be to maybe membrane encapsulate the entire process. However, you have to consider that translation is a very complex process that requires hundreds of factors to work together, and you would not only need to import ribosomes and other translation factors on top to your genetic expansion system, but furthermore, you would also need to export your protein afterwards if you don't want to study it in the context of the organelle. You would probably need a very complex, dedicated transport machinery in order to facilitate this. However, when you look into eukaryotic cells, there are also many membrane-less compartments that form by liquid-liquid phase separation that can still perform complex tasks. And so we were thinking that maybe we can choose a similar approach because this would have the advantage as it has no membrane boundary. It's basically open to the surrounding nucleoplasm and cytoplasm and should therefore enable access, for example, to ribosomes and other translation factors. Besides just using phase separation, we also envisioned that we could maximize spatial separation by fusing our synthetic organelle to kinase and motor proteins that move towards the microtubule plus end. And here the naive idea is that as the minus ends of the microtubules is at the microtubule organizing center, which is somewhere in the center of the cell, 
if we have a plus interacted motor protein, it would constitutively move our organelle to the periphery and thereby form a layer of translational activity at the rim of the cell. We particularly use two different kinase motor proteins, kinase 13A and kinase 16B, and also two different phase separation systems, FAS and EWSR1 or SPIT5, and all of them work selectively. And the best working one is highlighted here in red. This is based on kif 16 b and FAS and EWSR1, which are two human well-known phase separating proteins. What do I mean with works best and most selective? So most selective means that the targeted mRNA is really exclusively translated with the expanded genetic code. And in order to assay for this, we develop a dual color reporter, which expresses GFP and then cherry mRNA from one plasmid, both with stop codons at permissive sites. And here only the M-cherry mRNA is tagged with MS2 loops. So in case of a cytoplasmic genetic co-expansion system, you would expect to produce both full-length GFP and M-cherry and get a diagonal population in flow cytometry, while when the organ is working selectively, you would expect to produce only M-cherry, and this should give you then a vertical population in flow cytometry. And this is how this looks in real cells. Here it's for the ember coder, and this is in hex cells. And when you have a cytoplasmic system in the upper row, you see you roughly have a diagonal because the mRNAs can't be distinguished. However, when we use the synthetic organelle, we get highly selective expression of the targets and cherry mRNA. And now only spatial proximity defines selectivity, so we can easily swap this to other codons. And by just mutating the tRNA and the codon in the mRNA, we can also just as selectively translate OCA and OPAL codons within our organelle. Next, we wondered whether our organelles could also maybe participate in more complex translation, for example, in the translation of transmembrane proteins that need to be inserted into the ER during translation. And here we developed another dual color reporter, however, now with two structured proteins that have specific subcellular localizations. And as a reference, we here use nucleoporin 153, tagged to, with GFP, and we try to selectively express insulin receptor with M orange. This is then also tagged with MS2 loops. Gratifyingly, when we use the synthetic organelle, we have no nucleoporin produced anymore, but we can still see nice rims at the plasma membrane, shown here in magenta, which show the insulin receptor, so this works nicely selectively. We wonder how can these organelles actually work so selective, so in order to better understand this, we then perform stainings against components of the organelle. So here we co-stain paralyzing tRNA synthetase as well as its tRNA, which is shown here in yellow. And in case of the cytoplasmic genetic co-expansion system shown in the upper row, you see that tRNA as well as the tRNA synthetase are broadly distributed throughout the cytoplasm. However, in case of the synthetic organelle, you can see that one micron-sized synthetic organelle is formed per cell and that there's no tRNA in the rest of the cytoplasm, so the tRNA is really effectively depleted. Furthermore, we were able to visualize that also ribosomes can get access to these organelles. And here we co-stain for ribosomal protein 26, which is shown here in cyan. And this nicely co-localizes with the structure of the tRNA synthetase, which is shown here in magenta again. What you can see here really that ribosomes seem to be really inside of the organelle. And this could then explain how translation happens here. And so with this in summary, what I've shown you today is that we can create synthetic organelles by co-expressing kinesin fused to a phase separation domain and the tRNA synthetase and the MCP protein. These form then a micron-sized organelle within the cell. They subsequently recruit mRNA MS2, paralyzing tRNA, and also a subset of the cellular ribosomes. And then only mRNAs that are translated within this organelle get modified with the non-canonical amino acid, while mRNAs translated in the cytoplasm are translated canonically. It means they are terminated when they encounter the stop codon. And so with this, we created the first cell that can simultaneously execute two different genetic codes depending on where protein is translated in the cell. And with this, I would like to thank my lab, particularly my supervisor, Edward Lemke, for this great project and support throughout my PhD, and also Gemma and Leonie, who contributed to the synthetic organelle work I would also like to thank Embed and the great PhD program and the facilities at EMBIL, particularly the flow cytometry and microscopy facility, which made this work possible. Mm -hmm.